interdisciplinary health professional grouping that seeks to work with ministries of health, training institutions, and other stakeholders to improve the quality of healthcare in Africa through research, education, and capacity building. Membership is open to African and external stakeholders committed to an Africa with strong self-sustaining and robust health systems. Welcome to our webinar made possible by AfriHealth. Our team at the University of KwaZulu-Natal Physiotherapy have already engaged in research around COVID-19 and the effects of prolonged use of technology, as well as COVID-19 and its influence on teaching and learning in health sciences in collaboration with other disciplines in health science, such as optometry and sports science. The team has also recently developed an infographic that teaches basic principles on positioning and exercise when infected with the virus. Today, our webinar is entitled, Living with the Long COVID. The webinar will explore the increasing prevalence of people who have been infected with COVID-19 and who now present with the long or post COVID syndrome. Participants will hear from two physiotherapists who themselves are living with long COVID about their daily challenges and how they are managing in their daily lives. Participants will also be provided with evidence-based information on the prevalence and pathology of long COVID. And we will also take a closer look at the cardiopulmonary complications associated with the condition. Participants, please post your questions into the chat and I will pose these questions to the panel at the end of the webinar. If you could also please keep your microphones off as well as your videos to assist with bandwidth. To begin, I would like to welcome both Dr. Hamilton Faro and Mr. Insikilelo Pefile. Insikilelo is a qualified physiotherapist and in 2003, he joined Medunsa as a lecturer in the Department of Physiotherapy. He obtained a postgraduate diploma in public health at the University of Witz in 2005. He also obtained a master's degree in rehabilitation studies from Stellenbosch University. He was a lecturer at the Department of Physiotherapy at UKZN for over a decade. In January, 2020, he joined the Department of Rehabilitation and Health Sciences at the University of Cape Town as a lecturer. Dr. Hamilton Farrow has been in academia for over 20 years. He graduated from the University of the Western Cape with his PhD in 2014. He's a member of staff at the physiotherapy department at the University of KwaZulu-Natal currently. His passion is youth, especially youth at risk. He founded the Foundation for Communities of Excellence in 2015 which serves as a driver to change communities and the lives of young people through life skills training and creating pathways for tertiary education opportunities for all. Dr. Faro and Mr. Perfile are going to share their lived experiences being infected with COVID-19. This will be followed by research on long COVID as well as the cardiopulmonary complications of long COVID. Dr. Faro, could you please share your experience of being infected with COVID-19 with us? Good evening, Prof Chetty. Um, and good evening, everyone on the webinar. Um, uh, when, when one gets into a webinar, um, you never think that it will be because of some virus that you actually um, got infected with and you now have experience to speak about it as a health professional. Uh, we tend to think that we, we treat patients and we don't get into that position. So on, on the 23rd of December, um, I got tested because I started feeling not so great. 
Um, and it started with simple um, sinusitis that I thought was actually a bit more um, than before. Um, and for the next 14 days, I started with my fight with this virus. Um, as soon as I knew I was positive, um, the first five to six days was a fight with fever. Um, and then, but, but all just in, in the head with the sinus um, and, and the fogginess and, and that kind of struggle. Um, and then the next eight days, by day 10, um, which was um, New Year's Eve, I was taken by ambulance to, to hospital because when I woke, I was actually looking for a breath. And I, I didn't even think that that's possible that you would get to a point where that's the struggle. Um, and when I checked my sets, uh, it was down to 70. And then as a physiotherapist, you have the thing in your head that I know how to do breathing exercises and I can fight that. Uh, but I just couldn't get, it, get the sets to go up. So I was taken to hospital and I was on, on oxygen for the next four, four days. Um, and I think I was lucky in the sense that I could get through that at that point in time. Um, I think the, the fight was that um, the secretion build up um, that again, as a health professional, you know that you can find ways to cough it out and to do all of that. But when I went to hospital, I knew that even with all the knowledge that I might have, I actually lost the battle of being able to influence getting better. Um, and if I don't get help, I will not survive. Mr. Pefilio, could you please share your experience of getting COVID-19 with us? Good evening, everyone. Can, yeah. can you hear me, Prof? Oh, perfect. Yes, uh, we good can. Evening. Thank you. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, my experience, I it started off as well as a, a, your normal flu symptoms and um, so it was a Tuesday after my morning run I felt a little bit groggy and so I just uh, thought it was just uh, being tired from the run and the following morning I woke up uh, with a general body pain and in some temperature so I self-medicated uh, for, for two days but on the third day I was not getting better and so I then I just continued uh, with, with self-medication. It was when a friend delivered a pizza uh, for me. Um, uh, and then I asked for a, a chicken and a beef pizza. And they actually, when I tasted both of them, they actually tasted the same. And, and later that evening, I cooked um, chicken curry, but the chicken curry tasted exactly the same as the pizzas. And even the smell was, um, I could smell, I, I had what I now call and refer to as a COVID smell because everything had this distinct smell in it. Uh, that's when then I realized that I had COVID. So the following morning I woke up and I couldn't even reach uh, my bathroom um, from, from the bed to the bathroom. I uh, had severe shortness of breath. Uh, so I then, but I managed to get into the bath, I took a shower, and then I then rushed myself to the hospital. And that's when then I got admitted and I stayed in the hospital for two and a half weeks. But I was fortunate enough that I didn't, um, I was not um, admitted in a high care or uh, I was all ICU. Um, I just had I was in the normal, yeah, world. Thanks, Mr. Pefile. Dr. Faro, could you please 
maybe elaborate on the symptoms you are currently experiencing two and a half months post-infection? Um, yeah, let me, let me speak about the, the symptoms. And I think uh, I will start with, um, in the beginning, um, when, you, when, when, when this thing hit me and I came out of hospital, um, the first thing, and up to now, this is what I can tell you, one, um, I probably feel 10% of myself. Um, and that's quite something that, that, that boggles your brain because you, don't, you can't understand it. Secondly, the brain fog. Is, is a major, major problem at the moment for me. Um, when I started the short, short-term memory, so, um, and even now when, when I try and do a presentation and I get to certain words, I might even have used the words in a few sentences back and all of a sudden the word would just be gone. Um, the tiredness, um, so some days you, you are okay and then all of a sudden the next day you walk 50 meters and all of a sudden I'm just tired of just that 50 meters. Um, the tachycardia is something that really shocked me because um, whilst being ill in that first 14 days, um, the thing that, that really shocked me was the fact that my heart rate resting was at 120, between 120 and 140 beats per minute. Um, and, and, and even now, there are some times that, that I can feel that my, all of a sudden my, my heart is a bit more than it should be because I'm, I'm at rest. Um, it's not as bad as when it was in, in hospital. Um, and I think the other impact is the trauma of the disease on yourself um, and the trauma of the disease on the family around you. Um, as a father in, in, a home, in, in my home, I've never been ill. So my, my family saw me um, being ill um, and taken to hospital with an ambulance. Um, and that trauma and, and on myself, um, looking at my family and looking at their worry, all of that, and, and that, that has been a major thing. Um, so, so I think the one thing is that, that um, also that I also tend to find that I had to be wary about um, just not getting into a low mood where you, 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 you I think it's easy to, to become a bit, go into depression because of, of, of everything that you've gone through. And I think the major thing for me was the fact that you don't understand the disease. And, and we all do better when we understand something. And I think that makes it, makes it worse. And, and I've equated this disease by saying, the only way for me to describe it is that the virus is evil. Thank you, Hamilton, for being so honest with us and open with your experience. Uh, and Sikalelo, can you share your uh, experience of your symptoms now, post-infection and Can you hear me now? Okay. Prof. Cubbing, I think he's... Um, yes, okay, all right. Um, it, it last year, when I get back um, uh, to work around about July, I, I, I remember I went into... A, I, I, I forgot that there was a meeting and one of my colleagues uh, SMSed me and said, Ziggy, there's, there's a meeting, uh, uh, where are you? And I quickly went into, it was a Zoom meeting and I started to, um, to, to take notes in, in, in the meeting. Now I'm convening the calls and I had forgotten what was that I was supposed to be doing, but I continued to take the notes. And as the, after the meeting, uh, I switched off the computer and, I, uh, and then I, I, I fixed something to eat. And then when I get back to what I was, uh, doing on my notes, I couldn't remember uh, anything that I have written. I didn't know uh, why I had to follow up on uh, on the assessment. I didn't know what assessment I was talking about. And then I sent a message to one of my colleagues to say, "What was this item about?" And 
and then that continued uh, up and, and so and and then that created a, a bit of an anxiety uh, for me because now everything and every time I opened a work email, I could not remember because you know email uh, work emails they will refer to uh, as power at discussion, and I could not remember what was those discussions were all about, and that put me into a depressed mode. I was depressed and I got uh, anxious. Uh, to to an, to such an extent that I um, I actually had suicidal thoughts, and um, so but I could recognize the symptoms much more earlier, and I was then hospitalized in a, in a psychiatric hospital for about three weeks, and and I came back. Uh, but I could not understand why I was tired in the morning. In the mo I, I would wake up in the morning and I would not want to get out of bed. And I will have days that I would actually stay in bed for the whole day and I will have my laptop up with me in the bedroom so that I, I, I don't have to have the, the feeling of getting out of bed. And it would be difficult for me to walk from uh, from the bedrooms up uh, downstairs, and yeah, and then it it, it bothered me. It, it took me uh, two hours to read an article, and and by the time I'm in the results section of the article, or I'm in the discussion uh, section of the article, I don't know what this article was all about, and. And, and, and that made me to be worse in terms of the depression and, 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 and being anxious. Um, but then, uh, you know, in the psychiatric hospital, they, I mentioned this to the psychiatrist uh, because I was actually even thinking that it was uh, related to the depression and the anxiety. Uh, but the psychiatrist, uh, you know, pointed me to literature on, on long COVID. And, and then I started to read about long COVID and, and, uh, and I mentioned this to Saul and Saul also sent me some literature. And so I began to read. And uh, luckily for me, before I left um, um, Crescent Clinic, I then consulted the OT uh, that was working in and I said, you know what, I'm, I'm tired, I'm extremely tired and uh, I've lost my memory and I've, you know, I've got very poor concentration. And I started to work with, um, with the occupational therapist. And even after that, after I had left um, a Christian clinic, I, we had, I had, I have got friends and colleagues who are occupational therapists. So we started to do tele-rehabilitation. Uh, where I will get, uh, you know, exercises that will give me a, 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 a exercises to improve my cognitive functioning. They will give me uh, energy conserving techniques. And, and then I also started to, to walk. And then now my daily walks are the ones that are um, making it easy for me to get rid of the brain fog. Because if I walk in the morning, then I know that the rest of the day uh, is, is going gonna, is, is gonna to be okay. And then Again, midday, run about one o'clock or two or two o'clock or half past one. I need to walk in order for me to continue for the rest of the of the of the of the afternoon. Yes, no, that's where I'm currently at, and uh, having that, and also have to juggle, you know, work because our work as academics is cognitively demanding, and having to juggle that, and having to juggle, you know, me completing uh, my my completing my PhD. It has been a struggle. Thank you so much, Nsikile. Yeah. Uh, Chat commending you for your honesty and for being so brave to share these raw emotions with us. And um, it's difficult not to get choked up because you are so close to us. Uh, thank you so much for being so honest and open and Maybe if you can just um, share a little bit more on some of the coping mechanisms and strategies that you used to, you know, get back to your old self again. Okay. 
between me and Saul. I don't know. Am, am I on now? <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. Um, I, I, I wake up very early and uh, because I now take longer uh, to prepare myself to get to work. So I have to wake up very early in the morning and I have to do the running. Uh, and then after that, I come back and I, I use um, Dr. Caroline Leaf, uh, uh, you know, strategies on how to, you know, rewire your brain and, and that sort of put things into perspective. And then I plan and then I have, uh, yeah, it works like a charm. Uh, I, I take a hot, hot shower and that is in, in, immediately after that, I have a very cold shower. Uh, so that sort of wakes me up and uh, I'm also taking supplements. Uh, I'm, uh, I take um, a vitamin B complex uh, as well as some iron tablets. Um, and yeah, but exercise has been my, uh, my, my remedy for the brain fog. So I have to continue. Uh, on an interval, I have to take a walk. I have to leave my, if, if, I'm, if I'm in the office and my job is very flexible enough in terms of the time. So I would stop working at around about one o'clock or 12. And then I'll go down around and then I'll come back to my office and then I'll continue. Because yeah, the, the brain fog, it paralyzes you. It, you, you don't know uh, what you have just done an hour ago and yeah. Thank you so much, Nsikalelo. Um, Hamilton, could you share with us how you are coping now and maybe some coping strategies and mechanisms that you have placed into your life so that you can get through some of the symptoms of long COVID? Um, thank you, Varusha. Um, I think firstly, just to explain, so on the 18th of December, my mother-in-law has been staying with us for the past and we look after for the past 12 years um, passed away. So when I landed up in hospital, um, we were still dealing with that loss. And it's quite strange that part of the coping mechanism, firstly in hospital to fight the virus was my wife sending me messages to say, you cannot focus on the loss now. Um, you cannot think about that we've lost Oma because you have to think about yourself and you have to get through this first before we can do anything else. Um, and I think for me, part of the, the coping mechanism was that, that as a family, and it's quite strange to say this, the past four years, we've gone through very difficult times. And because of that, our spiritual life and our, our faith um, has been enormous. And, and, and that's been a, a foundation for, for why we are coping through this, because we have our faith to, to base it on. I think we, we are also fortunate, and I think both me and Bafila, we're fortunate that, that we come from a family of colleagues. And, and I think um, Saul is one of the people in Varusha and Stacy that's on here that I can say, but because of their interaction with me, um, it's helped me to stay afloat. Um, the information that Saul has given to say um, what you are feeling and what you are going through, you are not the only person because I think, and I think Pafila will probably agree with me. I think part of it, it's, it's human for you to feel that you feel ashamed that you can't be yourself and that you can't do what you, what, what, what you normally do. Um, and, and your confidence goes, it's, it's, it's amazing because all of a sudden you don't have a confidence to do something. Um, so with colleagues like these, you were able to have people that support you and that helps to, to, for you to understand what you go through. Because I think the one thing that this disease, this virus has taught me is that when you get the virus, you are only a patient. No matter whether you're a neurosurgeon, a physiotherapist, you are a patient and you are a human being and you go through the anxiety and the fear like everyone else. And I think part of the reason why we are fortunate maybe to be able to be here is that we found a way to overcome the fear and the anxiety. Because I now understand why people in hospital die. Because I think when the fear and the anxiety overcomes you, there's actually nothing that, that's there to fight, fight back with. 
Um, and then my family, obviously, um, uh, because we are a strong family, um, I had something to hold on to. And they could come and say, but we, we're supporting you and we're making sure um, and, and we're making the food and, and we, we're carrying your burden. Um, and and I, I say it a lot. We are privileged in that, that because of those things, I can do this. It's not something special. And I think one must, must be grateful that I was able to do that because the one thing that I've realized about this virus is with me, part of the coping and getting through the brain fog and all of that, and the fact that when you do an activity, it takes all your energy. I actually realized that I don't eat because I'm trying to build my reserves. I eat because there's no reserves. So when it's taken everything, it means when I do breakfast, it, it means the breakfast is for the next two hours. And then in two hours time, I, I realize that I need to eat again because there's no, there's no energy. Um, and, and that, to me, the frustration of that is, is probably the most difficult part because I've always found myself to be someone that don't need to be motivated because I'm inspired for, for the things that we do. So I get up and I want to work. But um, with the documents, the reading of it, it is an absolute battle to get through that. Um, and then I think it, 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 um, by, by, by being able to speak to other people, um, and getting to know what other people are also going through, that helps. Um, and, and also some of the exercises that you do in between. Um, I think part of the exercise part is also to do something that makes you forget about what, you've, what you're going through. Um, a last thing that I want to say, I think the, the mental part, the mental health part is an enormous, a very big thing to worry about. Um, I, I remember that the last night in hospital was actually the worst night for me because you were starting to, to feel better, but that meant that you were hearing the suffering of other people. Um, and that is something that, that I will never forget. And, and I can only imagine that people who have stayed longer in hospital, um, what impact that, that would have. Um, but if I, if I should take it, I, I, I would say that family, your, your faith, um, your colleagues, and I think we need to get colleagues to be understanding because I know in some, some areas people are not understanding. They expect you to function at 100%. And like I've said, I feel like I'm at 10% at the moment. Um, and, and, and sometimes you, you do feel sort of ashamed about it because you need your colleagues to do some of the stuff that you would normally do. Um, and you're just hoping that they feel okay by doing that for you. Thank you so much, Hamilton, again, for your honesty and just exposing, you know, the inner workings of how you got through this. Uh, I think uh, Insikalelo had his hand up. I'm going to give him one minute uh, because the other speakers will follow and we don't want to yeah. encroach on your time. So just one minute and then we'll move on. You know, I just wanted to attest to what Hamilton was, was saying about the, you know, the guilt and the shame that comes because you, you, you sort of professionally lose your, your, your integrity. As, as, a, as a professional because, and your dignity uh, during that process, because now you cannot do the things that you can normally do. And, and again, I then, um, you know, watched a, a, bum, a friend of mine recommended uh, some sermons or some videos by Brene Brown on how to deal with shame. And uh, yeah, so yeah, I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you so much, the both of you. We'll get back to you a bit later. Hopefully we'll get to the question and answer session. But uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Saul Cobbing, uh, who is a um, qualified physiotherapist and biokineticist. And he's currently an associate professor in the discipline of physiotherapy at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. He graduated with a PhD in physiotherapy in 2017, and he's currently a fellow on the drill program. His postdoctoral research aimed to develop and implement community interventions for the rehabilitation of people living with HIV and other chronic diseases in under-resourced communities. Saul will address the research on long COVID and please be encouraged to post your questions on the chat and hopefully we'll get to them later. 
Evening, everyone. I um, hope you can hear me. Um, I know it's actually afternoon for some people, or even kind of middle of the day. So I really want to welcome all our friends and colleagues across the world. It's, it's quite amazing, the turnout. And we thank all of you for making the time to come here. I see ex-students of ours. I see friends and colleagues from the United Kingdom, from, from Canada, uh, from, from parts of South Africa and uh, Cape Town, other parts of Africa. So we really appreciate it. Um, excuse, I'm also kind of the very average uh, host. So excuse me if there are any glitches. I'm just trying to get my, my screens up as well. Um, okay. Right, so today I'm just going to be talking about the research on long COVID, and it's a very kind of general term for a huge topic. You know, we could do a week uh, course on this or longer. There are courses being offered, but I just really want to um, expose everyone to what long COVID is for those who don't know, and just give a little bit of the research on it. Um, okay, so... You know, starting with the name, um, what, why long COVID, okay? And in, in reading a lot around this area, I came across at least 10 different names for this condition, okay? The one you'll see quite a lot is post-acute COVID-19 syndrome or just post-COVID syndrome. Um, you'll see chronic COVID syndrome written quite a bit, CCS. And the next one is really a reason why we shouldn't get you know, medical people or academics to name conditions. This you'll see written in a couple of the articles, post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 COVID infection, PASC. And imagine trying to say that, you know, this is the kind of exclusive language that academics like and, and exclude, you know, actual patients and people who have these conditions. And, and the lovely thing about long COVID, and there aren't many lovely things about it, but it really is the first condition that is, um, you know, it's, it's been named and managed and the advocacy has come through social media. And that's why I've put hashtag long COVID, okay? Um, because the name first came to prominence on, um, on Twitter, okay? It was an Italian woman who first used it, I think in May last year, and Italy was an area that was really hard hit in the early part of the pandemic. Um, and this name has been used across social media despite attempts by academics like myself and medical people to kind of bring in other names and it very much has stuck and this is the name we are using. Sorry, I'm just gonna try to go to my next slide. So who does it affect? Okay, and I suppose the more pertinent question is who doesn't it affect? It really can affect absolutely anybody. Okay, so anybody who has had acute COVID infection can have the lingering effects of long COVID for months and even longer. We have some people even on this chat who now over a year living with long COVID. The estimates of prevalence, I mean, there are lots and lots of papers on this from all over the, the world. Um, the pay, you know, you see some estimates at around 5% and then some as high at 87%. And I suspect, you know, the, the higher number is far more close to the reality. And I think the difference, this huge difference in, in these prevalences is the way we look at, at illness and disability. And if you look at a very medical sense, you know, is there a test we can do for this or a blood test? You know, you're gonna get these very low values. But if you actually start asking patients and people who are living with long COVID, do they have any of these symptoms that people are describing? You'll find that nearly everyone has symptoms that go on way beyond sort of um, 10 weeks, three months. And this is interesting. You know, again, I've looked at a lot of papers here and there's, there's really no papers giving an absolute significant relationship between how severe the illness was and, and the length and severity and how, you know, how bad the long COVID is. And, you know, we've heard from Inseki and Hamilton, and I'm just in awe of, of their brave testimony and, and being colleagues, I know how much they've struggled. 
and, and it's just really wonderful to have you talk today. But, you know, they, they were hospitalized, but they weren't in ICU, you know. Um, and they, in Siki particularly, he's now into about his eighth, ninth month. There are people I know listening to this webinar who, who didn't even go to hospital. They had supposedly a mild bout of COVID. And they, you know, a year later, they still feel in some ways, you know, that they haven't got over this. As much as, as COVID and long COVID could affect anybody, we know that people's experiences are not the same. And just as in COVID, as we saw how it's disproportionately affected minorities and, and people living in poverty, so too does long COVID, you know, have, have more of an impact potentially on, on people who have less, people who are minorities, people who live on the margins, okay? And, you know, Hamilton gave great testimony there how having his family and, and loving people in a wonderful home really helped him pull through what's been a terribly hard challenge for him. Um, another thing that really interests me, as a, I'm a physiotherapist and, you know, so are my colleagues and many people listening in are health professionals. What's fascinating is this idea of being a health professional, but also being someone who's recovering from COVID and is having to now deal with your own condition, but also try and advocate for your patients and educate your patients. So that's something we really need to look a lot more into. What I should have said up front, really, we must, this is very kindly being hosted by AfriHealth and the research, there is very little from Africa. You know, I, two days ago, Darren Brown is listening here, kindly shared me a paper that's just come out in Nigeria showing about 40% prevalence uh, of people who had COVID who go on to have long COVID. But there's very little research. And as, as African health professionals and researchers, this is the kind of work we need to do, okay? For those people who are not convinced and who like celebrities, here's a quote from a certain Dr. Anthony Fauci, who's having a bit of an easier time now under Joe Biden than he did under Trump. And he said, we do know for absolute certain that there's something called long COVID. Between 25% and 35% of COVID-19 patients have lim lingering symptoms that last much longer than those from other viral syndromes. And I think Dr. Fauci has underestimated that, but even if this were to be true, you know, one in three people at the very least um, are gonna be living with, with long COVID. So guys, I, I have very little time. So just a few quick bullet points on on what the kind of symptoms are. But, you know, the most important thing was that you listened to Nsiki and Hamilton. And, and we, we did that for a reason. We wanted, you know, the, these guys are great academics and health professionals, but more importantly, we wanted to hear their voices as people who've not just been through this, but are continuing to go through it. And a lot of these symptoms and, and sequela I mentioned are things they've spoken about, okay? So we know that Long COVID involves multi-system and episodic disability, okay? So um, I know, I think we've got Prof O'Brien on this as a seminar, has spoken a lot about episodic disability and HIV, and a lot of us work in the field of HIV. And we're seeing the same kind of up and down pattern of people with long COVID. You know, Hamilton and Siki spoke about this. You have days where you feel okay, and then days when you really struggle to get out of bed. These are the kind of, Symptoms that keep coming up, most people are talking about, you know, fatigue, very serious, long lasting fatigue, post exertional malaise, and this brain fog or cognitive dysfunction. The neurological symptoms are wide ranging and, and really serious. I've put a couple of here, a couple of them here, you know, as, as serious as things like stroke, various neuropathies, the brain fog I was talking about. You, an Oxford study looked at something like 212,000 patients and they find, found that 33% of people had psychiatric uh, symptoms uh, associated with long COVID. The mental health symptoms, you know, the low mood that, that our speakers spoke about, anxiety, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, whether it's linked to, to the physiology or indeed, you know, the, the incredible losses that people have seen their close families and also working as health professionals. Various musculoskeletal syndromes, arthralgias, body pain, a lot of GI symptoms, um, you know, things like diarrhea, nausea, loss of appetite. I was speaking to a friend the other day who, who kind of 
he feels he got he got away lucky. And when I started telling him some of the com common symptoms and said mention GI, he said his stomach has not been right for six months since he had COVID. So, you know, that's his particular difficulty. And then various others, guys. It, there are too many to go into. I've put a lot of references at the end of my talk here that I'm happy to share with you. But things like ongoing headaches, the problems with smell and taste loss that are well documented, ongoing fevers, rashes, the cardiopulmonary effects. We've got a uh, my colleague, Dr. Maddox, doing a talk on this because as physios, this is something we really deal with. So I'm not going to touch on that because she, she goes into this in more detail. Just a quick thing. This is not a talk on management of long COVID because we would need a whole day. But the truth is, we do not have a lot of evidence on this. We, we need more time to talk about it. And it must be led by patients, guys. Whether it's health professionals or our patients or lay people, let them tell us. You know, Don't come with that physiotherapist mindset like I have and you want people to get back on their feet and start exercising. In fact, we, we have a pretty good idea that, that exercise can be counterproductive and we be, need to be very, very cautious prescribing a graded return to exercise. And, and really, we just need to rethink our own teaching because we will all go out and teach people, be it our family or our patients, um, and also the, the way we practice, okay? Um, I saw a lovely quote in one of the papers that actually had a qualitative methodology. And this is a quote from one of the participants. So this said, the patient or participant said, I'm fairly driven and I thought I could beat this virus. A friend told me to stop dominating the virus and start accommodating it. Once you start accepting that, it becomes a bit easier. You have to drop your baseline by 90%. You are a different person. And I prepared this PowerPoint before I heard from Hamilton, his testimony now about feeling like 10%. And, and, and there it is, you know, this is someone else, but we're not talking about something mild and moderate here, guys. It's, it's very serious. Um, Sorry, if you can see that lights have gone off in the background, it's not an ESCOM failure. It's my office, it stopped sensing that I'm in the room, maybe wants me to go home. But I just wanted to share a few resources. The last slide will be a whole lot of papers that you can ask me for, but more important than the academic papers is, is actually getting on social media and interacting with people doing great work in this area, area. So I have to put our own department first. We recently started our own Twitter handle and that's it at UKZN Physio. Check out AFRI Health, the organizers of this webinar. And, and I hope as AFRI Health, we can start doing more work in this area. Um, a, a resource that was a wonderful help to me and some of the founders of this resource are on this chat, Long COVID, at Long COVID Physio. Um, that's their Twitter handle. And this is their website. Um, it's a UK based group and, and great advocates for uh, helping people with Long COVID support groups, information, it's it really a good site. And also the Long COVID Alliance in the US have some lovely courses and information. You can go on physio physiopedia.com for more info. And then the World Health Organization have a great open source site for various courses that you can check out. So that's really it. Um, I hope I haven't spoken for too long. I just really wanna thank you all for listening in. These are the references. I'm happy to share these papers. Uh, look me up on Twitter or drop me an email and I can give you these papers. They're all open access. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Saul. Uh, if you have any questions for Saul, you can post it in the chat box and I will make sure he responds at the end of the session. I'm gonna quickly introduce uh, Dr. Stacy Maddox and she's a lecturer in the physiotherapy department at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. She recently graduated with her PhD in physiotherapy. Uh, she currently fulfills the portfolio of the cardiopulmonary lecturer at the university with expertise in the intensive care unit. She is the executive African member on Realize, which is a Canadian collaborative in HIV and rehabilitation. And Dr. Stacy Maddox has done the research around the cardiopulmonary complications of long COVID. Don't forget to add your questions for Stacy in the chat box and she'll address them at the end of the session. Stacy.
So you need to unmute her. Apologies, guys. I'm just trying to find where Stacey is now. Hmm. I'll get there. Perfect. Hello, everybody. Um, Good evening to you all. Thank you, Prof Chetty, uh, for your introduction. And thank you to Ntiki and to Hamilton for being so candid with us. Um, that was so insightful. For me as a rehabilitation professional, it's so good to hear this coming from the ground. So today I'm going to just touch on some of the complications that we can anticipate in the patients that we will see post the acute phase. So these might be patients that rock up in your outpatients department or patients that you see on home visits. Um, I'm going to include in my presentation my own personal experience with a patient um, that is uh, a long COVID sufferer. Okay, so the inflammatory nature of COVID-19 uh, demonstrates persistent cardiopulmonary abnormalities significant for us as the rehabilitation community. Some of the mechanisms driving cardiopulmonary complications are inflammation, being in a hypercoagulable state or prothrombotic state, and the hypoxemic effects of respiratory failure. Persistent post-viral inflammation is considered an additional contributing factor to cardiac injury. Several studies have noted the occurrence of myocarditis, pericarditis, myocardial infarction, dysrhythmias, as Hamilton mentioned, pulmonary embolus, and heart failure in patients post-acute COVID infection. A recent study um, by Kotika et al. was conducted on 148 uh, convalescing patients post-hospitalization for serious COVID-19 infection, all of whom had increased troponin levels. Now we know that when we have increased troponin levels, it means that there's been some myocardial injury. The study found that approximately half of the sample showed myocardial injury on imaging, a quarter of the patients had ischemic heart disease, and among them, two thirds had no previous history of cardiac disease. And I found that quite significant. Another study by Puntman et al, which has been widely cited, observed for cardiac involvement among 100 participants who had moderate to severe COVID-19. 60% uh, had recovered at home and only 33% of them in hospital. So for all intents and purposes, Ntiki and Hamilton could have been part of this cohort. In this cohort, 78% displayed cardiac injury post-recovery from acute COVID-19 disease. And these, uh, this cardiac injury was measured by uh, cardiac magnetic resonance imaging. Um, so for us as rehabilitation specialists, when do we suspect that a patient might have cardiac involvement Let's say for someone again, like Ntiki or Hamilton, who have not had these imaging done, they come to you for treatment, um, the usual symptoms, okay? So first of all, we suspect if, if they have new onset chest pain. Um, according to the patient that I have been seeing, she said the chest pain associated with COVID-19 is very different. She said it's a burning chest pain that feels pretty much the same as you would feel if you had run a long race and you're tired. She said that chest pain corresponds to low oxygen saturation. So she said to me, I know when my sats are low. 
when my chest starts to burn, I check my pulse oximeter and I know I need to increase my oxygen. This is an oxygen dependent patient. Um, so new onset chest pain, palpitations, exercise induced dizziness and syncope, which is of course fainting. Um, the use of exercise therapy in COVID-19 is currently very topical and in many papers it's debated, okay? Intense cardiovascular exercise must be avoided for approximately three months um, post-discharge in all patients post myocarditis and pericarditis. Return to sporting exercise should be guided by functional status, absence of dysrhythmias, and evidence of normal left ventricular systolic pressure. Of course, measurements like D-dimer and CRP are also important um, before starting heavy sporting activities if you were a patient who had myocarditis or pericarditis. Now moving on to some of the pulmonary effects. Um, chronic cough, cough, fibrotic lung disease, bronchiectasis and pulmonary vascular disease are some of the main pulmonary conditions associated with long COVID. A study conducted by Raman et al. Investigate, aimed to investigate the prevalence of persistent multi-organ injury or inflammation in patients post-COVID. Persistent inflammatory changes were seen in 71% of COVID-19 survivors at three months post-discharge. And this was evidenced by a high proportion of parenchymal abnormalities on lung MRI. Some participants also demonstrated abnormalities in spirometric values. And those were your forced expiratory volume in one second and your forced vital capacity. Overall in the study, 64% of the patients complained of breathlessness and 55% reported fatigue. When conducting cardiopulmonary exercise testing among the participants in the study, 29% were unable to complete. And the reasons for me were quite fascinating. The majority of the patients that were unable to complete their cardiopulmonary testing, exercise testing, were actually due to muscle pain rather than breathlessness. Only 10% of the patients did not complete the test due to breathlessness. This finding highlights the disabling consequences of the inflammatory nature of the disease, as well as the anticipated effects of catabolism being in ICU and of course deconditioning. Of most concern for me as a therapist is the potential for pulmonary fibrosis which we saw in the literature with SARS and MERS patients. Um, we know that for patients with pulmonary fibrosis, the disease has a large impact on the functional capacity and then the quality of life. And this is where I find myself with the patient that I've been seeing, a family friend of ours, who was in ICU for 64 days, was managed with CPAP and a high flow nasal oxygenation. She did not, she was not ventilated mechanically, invasively at all. Um, but she really, really is now presenting almost two months post discharge with long COVID. I have her, her CT scan results here, and they show signs of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, bronchiectasis and architectural distortion um, in the lung and fibrotic changes. And these are things that are, as a therapist, I am very concerned about for a lot of the population. Um, this patient, so far, what all I've done with her is to, when I first saw her, she had a respiratory rate of 45 breaths per minute at rest. So she was extremely tachypneic. Her breathing pattern was all over the place. So we started just with 
breathing control exercises. I know the family had uh, some inspirometers that they wanted her to use and they were quite eager to get her going because they didn't know where to start. And that was another thing that struck me. How well are we doing in terms of our aftercare programs for these patients? Are we preparing the family adequately enough for them to take care of this patient at home? This was an able-bodied 58-year-old woman who went into hospital with no comorbidities and now can just about manage going to the bathroom. Fortunately, she has a young daughter at home to her sister, but what happens to us in Africa where we know that we don't, our, the majority of our patients may not have the resources to call a physio or call a friend to assist them in times, severe or long COVID uh, experiences that they might have. Um, it, it was encouraging for me I went back to see the patient now two days ago. Um, after giving her just very general advice at first, I said to her daughter, please don't try anything with her until we can get her breathing controlled, which we did on, in the first session. I advised for very functional activities. So oxygen saturation monitoring constantly, um, going to the bathroom and back, going to the kitchen and back you know, um, monitoring that she's on. When I saw her, she was on double oxygen. She was receiving oxygen via nasal prongs and via non-rebreather mask. When I went back two days ago, she is receiving um, three liters of oxygen via nasal prongs. And she got to walk 60 meters uh, with me. Yes, she did desaturate down to 82%. I said in future, we must try and keep that up to 85% rather according to the literature. But within two, month, two minutes, her oxygen saturation had risen back up to 95%. So that was encouraging. Um, what this experience has done for me is that it's made me realize how important it's, it is right now for all of us as rehabilitation therapists and largely for the multidisciplinary team to come together and to pool our resources and to consider the ways in which we're going to discharge these patients and what plan of action we're going to have to manage them going forward. Um, I'm, I don't have much time, but um, the Dutch Royal Society for Physiotherapy released some guidelines for rehabilitation that were quite simple. And they took into account the ICF framework and they recommended that for the first six weeks post-discharge, function uh, focus on functional activities and activities of daily living. With the patient that I'm seeing, one of the things she does now, she folds the washing. And she feels good about it, um, that she can do that to assist with daily tasks in the house. Um, she gets tired afterwards, but we've taught her how to monitor that. But at least she's being functional and she feels useful. Um, also, we must treat the patients, use specific um, individuated programs for our patients. So we can use a patient-specific functioning scale um, to determine the baseline level of difficulty. Um, I've told them that oxygen saturation and heart rate must be measured before, during, and after exercise. Um, and we want the oxygen saturation lower limit to be at about 85% during activity and at 90% at rest. Um, we can use the Borg scale to measure the rate of perceived exertion. And we want the patient to be able to just perceive breathlessness. Um, I always tell them about the sing test versus the talk test. So they must be able to talk, but feel a bit breathless while they exercise. Okay, I think I'm over my time. Um, but just to wrap up, I think it's also important for us to determine when we are assessing our patients, whether the patient is um, cannot complete the activity due to um, 
cardiopulmonary effects of the disease or due to the musculoskeletal changes that have occurred due to inflammation and due to deconditioning. And then we need to address that as well. Um, for some solid advice regarding exercise guidelines in these patients, please refer to the BMJ publication titled Returning to Physical Activity after COVID-19, and it's authored by David Salman et al. Uh, that was a publication that came out in January this year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stacey Maddox. Your passion around the cardiopulmonary complications is palpable, and we really appreciate the effort you put into preparing that for our participants. So there's actually just one question, uh, and then we're going to just um, conclude our session, and that is for Hamilton and Insicalello, and it's actually focused around a comment by Beatrice, and she uh, shared about stigma, you know, there's stigma around um, being infected with COVID-19 and now long COVID. Um, can you maybe give us some suggestions as to how we can sensitize people to COVID-19 related stigma? Sikilelo and then Hami. Saul is going to unmute you. Am I not? Am I on now? And well, well, I think, uh, Prof. I think we need to continue the dialogue, and then I think we need to continue the dialogue in in so many uh, other platforms, uh, so that we can increase awareness. Uh, yeah, and then we, yeah, we, we just continue to talk about it and 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 let people know exactly what is happening. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Hamilton? Um, yes, I think it's, it's absolutely right. What I try and do now is every platform, every public platform I, I get the opportunity, um, I speak about what I've gone through simply because I wanted people to know there's, there's no shame in, in, in having been infected and there's no shame in understanding that you will struggle through certain things and we need to talk about it. Um, what I've heard from people is that um, they they felt lonely, they felt unsupported, um, and they felt that there's no way forward for them because it's as as if um, people don't want to speak to them, uh, people avoid them. Um, so I think if we as health professionals, if we already know that most of us are frontline workers, but I think we now need to be the frontline people saying I've been infected. This is what I've gone through. Um, and you, you don't have to be ashamed of, of where you are. Thank you so much, Hamilton. Uh, there doesn't, they, I don't think there are any more questions in the chat, but uh, I just wanna extend our gratitude to Darren and Kelly and others for sharing their resources on the chat. Uh, we really appreciate you engaging on this platform with us in South Africa. Thank you kindly for making time to attend our webinar. It's been a topic that's been really close to all our hearts and it's because of our staff and colleagues who we refer to as family who've been infected and the many, many loved ones that we've lost along the way. And we were keen to raise awareness around long COVID um, and to just get people to understand that this is very real. So we appreciate your attendance and we hope that we can communicate further and engage around this topic and we would like, if you have time, to please fill in the evaluation that's posted in the chat. And this is uh, an important task for Afri Health, and uh, maybe it would encourage them to give us the platform for more webinars in the future. Thank you, everyone, for attending. We appreciate each and every one of you. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Depends on where you are. Bye.